And would you believe that I've been on radio and television now for a hundred years and I've never mentioned my name ever once. Never once. And I suppose there was something like that. When I was working on Radio Luxembourg, we had a, a disc jockey there who was quite well known and I counted. He had a 15-minute show and I counted how many times he mentioned his name and he mentioned it 32 times in 15 minutes, right? <laughs> now, I've never mentioned it once in 100 years because if if people don't know who I am, I'd look. <laughs> and they do, they're doing me a favour anyway. Uh, so, so you've mentioned your name. That, to me, would be anathema. Mm. My name is Robert De Niro. <laughs> I've been thinking about what makes you different and the fact that you dress differently and you talk differently and the cigar's different and the act was different and you've had so many different jobs. I think that sums up your life, isn't it? You try and be different. I never actually tried to be anything. I started off loud down the pit and I used to go up at half past four in the morning and walk a mile and a half to catch a bus and then I'd get to the pit and I'd walk another mile and a half, bent double, banging my head on the girders and things like that. So all I ever wanted was to stop in bed. Now, how can you stop in bed? <laughs> you can't stop in bed if you're a plumber. You can't stop in bed if you're a builder or anything like that. And so the only thing I found you could stop in bed was to run a disco or a dance hall or something like that. Because at least you could stop in bed till 12 o'clock, right? And that sort of, that bad starts that stoted me down to the ground. And then I turned it into a bit of fun and I thought, stopping in bed is terrific. Uh, what else is there? And I thought, I know, a bit of fun. So I had a bit of fun at nobody's expense. Never did any harm to anybody in my life. Uh, but stopping in bed, because when you come to think, it was, since I've been working in hospitals as a volunteer, uh, the number of people that get brought in between daybreak and about 12 o'clock lunchtime on trolleys is amazing and they've all done themselves in somehow <laughs> so if I stop in bed I've missed all that <laughs> missed it all it's all gone so if the, you learn nothing else from this interview the longer you sleep and the more you stay in bed the less chance of anything happening or going wrong if you can get away with it a lot of people can't get away with it a lot of people like to do that but they can't get away with it I was lucky in so far as I got away with it and people were sorry for me anyway, because who wants to be me? <laughs> Nobody wants to be me at all. <laughs> Not really. They'd like to have what I have, but they don't want to be they don't want to pay the price of being me. You see, what's interesting about you, you're incredibly modest and you like putting yourself down and you live quite a modest life, although it's quite a showbiz surrounding. We're here in your home today, which looks over a beautiful park and you've got the things around you. You've never wanted to be part of the London set and the showbiz hedonistic people that go out doing drugs and getting in all the papers, have you really? That was a lifestyle that never really appealed to me. I've got a place in London, in the posh part, in, in actual fact, I've got five places uh, that I go to from Scottish Highlands right down to Bournemouth and things like that. And people say, them five places, don't they cost you a lot? And I say, all five of them put together is cheaper than one wife. And they say, oh, oh don't remind me, Jim. Oh, do not remind me, you see. So it's all a bit of fun. It's all the nonsense. Are you happy? I think that's the question that a lot of people have about you. We saw you on that Louis Theroux thing, and you're curious. There's no question that you have an odd life and deliberately play up to it, in my opinion. Have you enjoyed your life, and are you enjoying your life? One thousand percent, because I never really wanted to be anything. I never really wanted to do anything. I, as a volunteer porter at Leeds Infirmary, I never, ever wanted to be a doctor because I couldn't have the, the time or the inclination to study, 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 and then only know a lot about one facet of society, right? But yet, because I've been nearly 50 years at the sharp end of hospitals, obviously, I've picked up a lot. And only last week, as I'm speaking to you, did I deliver my first medical lecture at the Royal College of Medicine, in London, and, and it was a full house. 
<laughs> and they didn't know. They come from all over the world, these people. What were you talking about? Uh, well, the title of the lecture was, Don't Worry, Radiation is Good for You. <laughs> and I know nothing at all about radiation. <laughs> and they'd come from all over the world, and the, it was a packed house, uh, and I got a standing ovation, <laughs> and none of them can remember what I said. I was once told my voice is a bit like a chain coming off a motorbike. How would you describe it? No, that's, that's somebody having a go at you. It's, it's a joke. Is <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that at all. I don't think of people that way. Uh, you are what you are. You are halfway up the ladder of success. And with a bit of luck, you'll get up the top ladder of success. But like I did say to you, and I'll, I'll let the people know what I said to you earlier on, that if I walk down the street with a tracksuit on and a cigar in my hand and long hair and all that sort of stuff and John Lennon glasses, actually the, the Jimmy Savile glasses because I used to wear these and John saw these and he started to wear them. John, he was my pal for long <laughs> enough. And uh, and so they'll go and they'll say, oh, I've just seen him walking down Brigitte. Right? Now, if you walk down Brigitte, that'll be it. Now, if you wanted to get anywhere, 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 you've got to make sure that when you pass somebody, they're going to say, who the hell is that? Yeah, but you see, that's the difference between you and me, James. Mm. I don't want to be noticed. You do like it. You see, I like the radio. I'm hidden behind a microphone. I do my show. I go home and then I can get on with my life. You um, like being noticed. Yes. You see, that's why we split. You want to do your thing on the radio or you want to go home and do your thing privately. I never wanted to do my thing privately because there was no difference in between my job and my life. It was all the same. It was all the same. And that's why I do the things that I do. Uh, for instance, I own the National Spinal Injury Centre at Stoke Mandeville, which I built. Now, I single-handedly got all £20 million to build that and designed it on the back of a menu, all like people do. And... Uh, you, you learn things, you are things, but I don't change once I walk in there or once I walk into the LGI, I don't change. I am me for no reason other than I quite enjoy being me and it's good fun and that's the name of the game, good fun. But you run the risk of being normal. Now, if you run the risk of... <laughs> no, if you run the risk of being normal, you'll get normal wages and a normal lifestyle. But if you want to be abnormal, like me, I've had 36 Rolls Royces and all sorts of things, but I prefer running marathons. I want to talk to you about the things I've learned about you. One is that you created John Lennon's image. That's what you're telling me, because no, he nicked the no, idea of your no. glasses. I, I didn't say I created him, his image. The Beatles, when they lived in Liverpool and before they became famous, I had a disco in Manchester called The Three Coins. And it was in a street called Fountain Street, Three Coins in the Fountain. And they came and played that. I, nobody knew them at the time. And lo and behold, I was on a TV show, their very, very first TV show. And when I got back to Manchester, Mallard said, with them Beatles? And I said, yes. They worked here. I said, give over. Never work here. I said, yes, they worked here twice. And I went and got the wages book and it said, Beatles. Five pounds. That's all they got to travel from <laughs> Liverpool. And it said underneath, went down well. So they came back three weeks later for 15 pounds. Right? So they were my pals. But they were my pals in a more deeper sense than pals because I was part of their early life. And then I did my thing and won all the awards that I won. I've won about 140 different awards. Right? And they did their thing, so there was a rapport between us. And shall I tell you a quick Beatles story? I was going on an airplane to America to meet Elvis. Never seen him before, never knew him before. And there was no real reason why I should have gone, just because I was a chancer. And he'd sold 1,186,000 copies of It's Now or Never. And they said at the record company, oh, he's got a gold record. I said, I'll take it to him. And they said, what do you know about that? I said, <laughs> well, I'm going, I'd am going. i actually won an air trip to Los Angeles for something that I'd done. 
and he lived near there. So I said, I'll, I'll take it to him. And I managed to get hold of a telephone number where somebody who is, knows Elvis in his business might know where he was. That's all I had, just a scrap of paper. And on the same plane that I got on by an amazing fluke with the Beatles. They were going to America. And Silla Black. <laughs> uh, no, uh, 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 it wasn't. Yeah, it was Silla Black because she was a cloakroom girl at the, uh, the disco, the cavern. And so we all had this great meeting down at London Airport. Oh, oh, oh. So we're flying away and it was one of them boring periods. And John comes and sits down and he says, all right, King Solomon, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> Which was something to say, because, I mean, they were top of the world, you know. And I said, uh, he said, oh, come on, what are we doing wrong? I said, well, John, you're flying 3,000 miles to work. And I'm going to see a fella called Elvis who lives in America and he doesn't even go there. You can get Elvis out of <laughs> the sunshine and this and the other. His records, yes. And you can check out the Beatles never toured again. Individually, they did, because Paul liked touring, right? But the Beatles, as a group, never toured again because I was going to see a fella that lived in America and never even went there. And they were flying 3,000 miles. <laughs> to, to what? To earn money for promoters, to earn money for agents... But what were they doing for themselves, except travelling 3,000 miles? So the next set of questions I have to ask you is, does it ever become normal when someone like Paul McCartney or John Lennon knows you and wants to talk to you, and before you've even said anything, they're curious about you? Well, I don't know whether they're curious or not. I think they might want to know something in, in relation... I mean, John came and sat with me because he wanted to know if I could suss out and diagnose what they might be doing wrong. Because he was sat on a plane for seven hours or whatever it is, travelling 3,000 miles, and he couldn't work out why he was doing that. But he suddenly realised he was doing it to make money for other people that he didn't even know. But can't you see how special that makes you, that despite all those people around him, half of which were having him sat there do that, he chose you to ask that question? Well, he did that because he thought I could have the answer because I was odd. And if you're odd... You might have just have the answer to the question. You see, I never ever thought, for instance, that I was clever. Tricky, yes. I'm a very tricky fella. But tricky is much better than being clever. But you are clever because you're immense. No. That's an accident. That's an accident. And if you are clever, you can slip up because you're clever. But if you're tricky, you don't slip up. You never slip up if you're tricky. No, 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 because you're tricky. Because you can get out of it. Yes, if something <laughs> comes in front of you. Oh, can you get out of it? Because you're tricky. You can skirt round it. We're back with Sir Jimmy Savile on The Big Show, talking to the man who really mastered show business and understands the business of show seemingly more than anyone else. Because that's the point, isn't it? It is a business. Yes, it is a business, but it is a good business. It's a lovely business, and it's a business that promotes and sells pleasure so there's no reason why all that pleasure cannot enter your own life the only reason where show business is not a pleasure is when people forget what it is it's a pleasurable business it's a fun business it's not uh, you know you're not einstein or anything like that and you don't want a nobel peace prize you have a good time and if you have a good time that is addictive and that's communicative and other people have a good time so you all have a good time it's a, it's a good time business why do people in management these days take it so much more seriously and accountants get involved? I mean, it's not so much fun anymore, is it? It's It's more of accountants making money out of you. Well, what happens is that everybody wants a piece of the action. And so today, as I'm speaking to you, everybody... If you've got a pound in your pocket, somebody somewhere wants it. And they will come up with all sorts of reasons why you should give them a pound out of your pocket. It could be your last pound. They don't care about that. But they want your money. Now, that is a feature today. It wasn't like that 60 years ago, but it is today. So the whole world changes. And every time 
I get up in the morning, I almost tend to forget what happened yesterday, but I know that today is a new day, there's new strokes for new folks, and they're all going to come and try and cop for a few quid off me, and they've got no chance at all, because if I was a ghost, <laughs> if I was a ghost, I wouldn't even give them a fright, you see. What's your life about now? Because the show business days have passed. You're not doing primetime BBC One anymore. 18 million people in your heyday loved you week in and week out. As you sit here, as I'm looking at you now, how do you fill your days? What do you do with your time to, to bring that happiness? Wonderful. Wonderful. First of all, I'm a rare breed insofar as I'm a single fella. Uh, and which is why when people say, them five places you've got to live in. Aren't they expensive? And I said, not as expensive as a wife. Now, it's a bit cynical, is that? Uh, but my game was not to have one wife, to have a thousand. Now, a thousand wives, is, it makes your hair go white. Did you know that? <laughs> and, and it keeps you slim. <laughs> and you get people chasing you and looking for you and want to chin you and all that sort of stuff. But all there was is an oil drip and that's where you were yesterday. And you've gone, <laughs> right? Are you saying you were a stud muffin? No, 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 no. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> but all I know is that most people want one wife. I quite fancied having a thousand, like King Solomon. Uh, it was terrific, terrific. I think them shakes of old, where they had the harems and all that. Why couldn't you find one special person? Did you ever dream of that or did it never matter? Yeah, I tried every day. And then by five o'clock, I found <laughs> that that wasn't the special person, but I might find her tomorrow. <laughs> And it was, ter- in fact, my case comes up on Thursday. How hedonistic was your life? What, in, what, what well, hedonistic? how showbiz, how fun was it? I don't want to be too graphic, but I mean, you were in a, a line of business where a lot of people knew you. In the clubs, you were a sex symbol. Was it good being Jimmy Savile? I have been other people. When I worked down the pit, for instance, and I got uh, 74 pence a week down there, 13 and 9 pence in old money I got. And I was somebody else then, because I didn't know that this world existed. It didn't exist because there was something on called a war. And that really alters life for everybody. And I went through six years of World War II. That formed me into a completely different person. And when I came out of the pit and went to join a scheme called Lend a Hand on the Land, which meant you could volunteer because you needed food, needed this, that and the other. So were working on the land to me was fantastic. I did that for about... Six or seven months. Oh, yeah, 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 that was wonderful. And then I thought, hang about, it's too good is this. Sunshine, girls working in the fields with us, and all you could always dodge behind a haystack, and they're all wonderful things. And I thought, no, the, the clock of life is ticking away, and I think I need a few quid somehow. And so I started to run dances and discos and things like that. Didn't make any money much, but I got the name as a promoter, an entrepreneur and things like that. And I played records as well, uh, which was not done before. And I had a, a, a pal that invented things. And he invented a record player with an electric motor, so he didn't have to wind it up. And the speaker that I had on this particular machine was two and a half inches. That was all. Now look at the speakers today on concerts. Mine was two and a half inches. But I ran dances. My first dance I ran here in Leeds. Uh, and I wrote some tickets out and it said, Grand Record Dance, one shilling. <laughs> and 12 people turned up. I want to talk about your DJ days more in a moment. I just want to go back to the war days because you told me an incredible story before we started taping about, again, your knowledge and your ability to read. That was something that was unique around the people that you lived with. And it came in very, very useful for some of the worst reasons. Well, when I was about 12, 13, still at school, I went to what was known locally as the poor children's school because all our people were either in orphanages or homes or whatever or whatever. If you didn't have any money, that was a... They were technically, they were called elementary schools. There aren't any now. But there were no local as poor children's school. And I could read, you know, that's fair deals. Uh, and during the war, telegrams were delivered to houses. And if a telegram got delivered to a house, it meant bad news. Because somebody had always been 
missing in action or something like that. And people never opened their telegrams. They'd find somebody who could read. And because I could read, I did the whole block of streets round where I was. Is Jimmy in? We've got a telegram. Can you come and read it? And I'd go and open the telegram and I'd say, I'd read the thing. This is to report that Sun Sun has been killed in action. And before me, the entire family had collapsed. And I was to put the telegram on the table, get up and walk out and wait for the next one. So that's why going through six years of World War II was very formative. You didn't know you were being formed because you didn't know anything else. All you knew is you weren't going to sleep all night because an air raid siren was starting to get them and he'd go down to the basement. I could never understand why we actually went down in the basement because if a bomb dropped, the house would drop on top of you, <laughs> you see. But for some reason, everybody would run down to the basement. And I thought that was very strange. And I suppose <coughs> that was one of the first times I started to question what by then was law, which was your parents. Your parents were law, and they said, hey, go, 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 everybody downstairs. And it was more than my life was worth to say, why do we go downstairs? Why not go upstairs and fall on top of the house hmm. instead of the house falling on top of us? You know the emotional baggage <laughs> of reading those letters and passing on that information? Yeah. Did that stay with you or were you able to somehow decompartmentalise it and put it aside? No, there was no emotion at all. I didn't know what dead was. I didn't know what the war was. We knew there was something called a war, but we didn't know what it was for. We didn't know anything about it. It was a war, and all of a sudden, there was something called rationing, and there was ration books. We hadn't the faintest idea why any of that was about, but it was, and you just got used to it, that's all, and it was only when you grew up, up, and you grew older, older, that you realised what a war was, which was stupidity, and it's somebody somewhere had got a power, and they were called politicians, and they uh, went a bridge too far, and then they got other politicians to say, we must declare war on these politicians, right? And I, very strange, very strange, very odd, not for me. Coming back next, we're going to talk about your mum and dad. I know your mum was incredibly important in your life and still is. We'll do that after we take another piece of music. Who do you still love listening to now, all these years later after you play them on the radio? I've got a very wide taste, which means I've got no taste. And I just turn the radio on and whatever, that'll do for me. It doesn't matter whether it's a serious subject or a non-serious subject. I'll have a little listen, and after a few minutes, that's enough for me, and I'm off down the road, tra training for the next marathon. You're no good for me. I need loyal listeners. Yeah, well, you'll, <laughs> you'll get whatever you want, and not only will you get whatever you want, you'll also get whatever you deserve. <laughs> We're back with Sir Jimmy Savile talking to him about his life and his remarkable career. I want to talk about mum and dad because your mum, the Duchess, was so important in your life and we really got to learn about that with that Louis Theroux documentary. It was a big part of it. Do you think they misled us as to what was going on there? Because you still have items of clothing, for example, and some people found that strange. Well, strange to them, not strange to me. Everybody that is listening to this programme hundreds of millions of people will have photographs of departed relatives, departed friends, pictures of their loved ones. Pictures are all right, but when the Duchess went off, quite suddenly, as it happens, and I came home, because we live together, uh, just by con convenience and coincidence, not through emotion or anything like that, because she thought I was a thief, because she realised that money came from working, and I didn't work, and I got all this money, and there was cars and houses and things like that, and she was convinced I was a thief, and she used to worry, and she would say to people, I don't know what he does, but it's not what he says he does on the radio, I think he's a thief, you know, and I've told him to be careful every time he leaves the house. <laughs> and so for me, why keep a photograph, which of course I've got, but why not keep the clothes, or, or not all the clothes, but dresses and things like that, that she wore when I would take her somewhere, because I quite enjoyed taking her to places, because I was the youngest of seven four sisters and two brothers. And I was not the favourite by any means because I was a not-again child. 
when she was telling the neighbours she was up the tub, <laughs> they'd say, not again. <laughs> so I, I'm a not again child. <laughs> so I wasn't a favourite by any means. But we had this great sort of rapport and she was quite small and she had natural uh, golden hair and she was very kidnappable. When I took her anywhere, that was her finished. Somebody had oyster and taken her away and when I wanted to go, I wanted to go looking for her, you see. And it was a, it was a great sort of relationship. She never trusted me because she thought I was going to get nicked. <laughs> Finish up, banged up in the pokey. And, and she was good fun to have around, but she was 100% naive. She didn't, she'd had seven kids. She didn't even know where babies come from. She had the faintest idea. <laughs> it was amazing. So we had this great sort of rapport. Uh, and when she went, I thought, well, there's no point in her going. Not really. So instead of keeping just pictures, well, I keep a few dresses and things. And I've got them hanging up in a wardrobe. And occasionally, when I open the wrong wardrobe, and there's a dress, and I thought, oh, she wore that when we went to see the Pope. Because I said to her one day, uh, you want to come to Rome? And she said, yes, why? I said, I'm going to see the Pope. She says, don't, don't, don't joke like that. She says, you don't want to see the Pope. I said, I am. Do you want to come and see me? Don't be silly. And when we got to Rome, she was convinced that we were in Jersey <laughs> because she'd had a glass of wine on the plane and she got her and said it's Jersey and I said why are they speaking Italian she said they speak all foreign languages in Jersey and and so things like that those are star things but there's no sort of emotion as emotion there and so I keep a lot of her gear not through emotion I keep it through common sense and to me the gear that she wore when we went to see the Pope, even though she thought she was in Jersey, <laughs> it's too good to throw away. She must have been incredibly proud of you because mm -hmm. most sons don't get to take their mum to see the Pope. No, she was completely bewildered. She was more bewildered than proud. She never got around to being proud, I don't think. No, because if anybody said, oh, what's Jimmy like? Oh, oh, oh. I keep warning him, you know. Oh, I don't know what he's up to, but he's up to something. He never get this sort of money, you know, by doing what he's supposed to do. Uh, so uh, it was a very strange one-off relationship, and it suited both of us. And in terms of the money you mention, did you ever have a conscience about that? I know some stars magnanimously offer it back and say, no, I can't take that. Kenneth Williams was renowned for turning down money. How did you cope with it? I mean, you're just an average lad from Leeds. Yeah, no, so I only needed what I needed and if I got any more I've got the ability to make a few quid because I'm tricky like I said and so I don't mind uh, giving it to people that need it like for instance when I was building the Spinal Centre at Stock Mandeville uh, that needed 20 million pounds now how do you get 20 million pounds it's not easy but I love the prospect of it and I didn't have a shilling and I said, yeah, all right, I'll build a place for you. But getting it was a hoot from start to finish. And if you're lucky, uh, for instance, in the 1986 London Marathon, I was sponsored for £286,000. And there was, there was much moaning and groaning on the race because I was getting a million times more than the winner. <laughs> because I've made... I suddenly realised that coming last, you get far more money than coming first. Far more, and, and there's a lot, there's a lot less hassle because if you come first, you've got to train like a good one. Uh, but if you come last, all you've got to do, and what I used to do with the marathons, and this, you know, for somebody like you, it's an example of having a, a laugh, having a good time. I would set off the marathon with a big cigar in my mouth, right? And I'd charge off down the road. And people say, oh, this is Jimmy, look, oh, he's got a cigar in his mouth. And about 200 yards down the road, I'd take it out, and one of my minders would be standing by the roadside, and I'd give it to him, right? And then I'd go on 26 miles, and he would come about 300 yards from the finish, light the cigar, because you could hear me coming, because the people shouting and carrying on. And I'd cop for the cigar, 
and finished smoking the cigar, <laughs> right? Smoke coming out of it, and this, and that, and the other. And people, God bless them, especially newspaper men, and they, I'd love that, they say, how many cigars do you smoke on the way around, Jim? I say, oh, four to five. <laughs> and it was the same one. It was a con, a con job. That's called being tricky. And being tricky is better than being intelligent. I'm learning. I'm learning fast. What do you reckon to the smoking ban? Because, of course, you can't go in your restaurants and pubs now smoking your cigar. I can. Because I don't go in those pubs and restaurants and things like that. And anyway, nobody takes advantage of an 84-year-old pensioner who limps a bit. <laughs> I, I limp on purpose. And I bend over a bit on purpose. And I hang on to backs of chairs. <laughs> and the side of the poor sod. We're back with our remaining moments with Sir Jimmy Savile, the man who changed telly in many ways, but it seems to me would rather have been a sporting star. It's always kind of knocked you because you love sport, don't you? It's the last thing I ever wanted to be. The last thing I ever wanted to be was a sporting star. Because a sporting star, you had to train properly, you had to do properly, and you had to be a mentality. Me, I was a good fun person. I loved it. Uh, and when, when you're into it for fun... Uh, it's amazing because that's addictive and it's also communicative and it's infectious. So I was having fun and I was letting other people have fun and companies would say to me, will you sponsor our product? Not because I like their product, it's just that I was a fun person uh, and I didn't take liberties and, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't sticking white powder up my nose or anything silly like that. Uh, and so I would get jobs. For instance, I'd, I did mention that on the 1986 London Marathon, I was sponsored for £286,000, which was far more than the winner got. Who wants to be a winner when you can get loot like that for just having a, a good nobble and, and giving a cigar away at 200 yards and getting it back <laughs> 300 yards from the finish and all that sort of stuff? And the following year, somebody came and said... Uh, we'd like to what do you want so I said uh, have you got any cars and they said what do you want I said a Lamborghini so they gave me a new Lamborghini <laughs> now you 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 go to so you, any of your sports stars has anybody ever given you a Lamborghini they said bloody I haven't no and said well how come he got one oh well he's him he's different did you ever find a resentment in show business that you have this power, the power of the public to get the money, the power of your celebrity to get the endorsements? Let's go back, let's say, 20 years. They think I'm odd. That's all they think. They said, well, we can't sort of put a, a rule to him or anything because he's odd. And if you're odd, you're odd. I'm quite used to being odd. Uh, in fact, I actually think myself that I'm odd. Uh, and it, it, it's something that if you are, you are. And you can't, you can't suddenly not be odd. Uh, you're just odd, period. What are you most proud of? You've done so many things in your life, aside from your charity stuff, actually, because that's the most honourable thing you do, and you do it so brilliantly. I don't think there's anybody in show business raises more money and gives more money away than yourself. Professionally, what are you most proud of? Waking up this morning. Simple, uh, sensible, Honest, but I think that waking up this morning was one of the star parts of my life. And this morning I woke up, let me think, uh, yeah, I was on my own. And that is tremendous. <laughs> How often do you wake up in the morning and have to check to see whether there is somebody on the other side? Well, <laughs> not very often because, <laughs> because what happens, I'm a pushover and, and if... If somebody comes and knocks on the door and says, I've lost my keys to go in, I'll say, step this way. And they say, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> it's not my fault. I can't help it. I'm a single fella. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. You haven't broken any laws, have you? None whatsoever. <laughs> and, and if I do, well, I'll stand for that as well. You talk about waking up in the morning. What about not waking up in the morning and being back with your mum? Do you think about that? Uh, no, she have gone to heaven. I, I, I mean, I've lost my life a few times, one way and another, believe me. Uh, but I'm not quite sure. That t t the, the religious department at BBC once asked me if I'd write a book. So I said, yes, all right then. So I wrote a book, and the fence is there, blah, blah, blah. but we called the book God Will Fix It, right? And it sold for over nearly 40 years 
for, through Mowbray's, the religious publishers. And it's an odd book, but very palatable, which is why it sold for all those years. And the last page is that question that you just asked me about not waking up. And if I arrive at the gates of heaven and St. Peter says, you've been a very tricky man, you can't come in here, I'll break his thumbs because I'm qualified to do that because I earned a living being a wrestler. And I've never had a problem yet with anybody whose thumbs I've broke. <laughs> you talk about that, though, as if there's reasons for you going downstairs. Do you have a conscience about that? Is there stuff you've done that think you think will deny you access to the big man? No. I never brought any harm to anybody. I've never bad-mouthed anybody. It sounds a bit yucky, uh, but it's my nature. It's my lifestyle. And I never thought there was a profit in in being bad. Uh, there might be a profit for a few days, a few weeks, even a few years. But sooner or later, you get your comeuppance. And so the best thing to do... I mean, I know a million bad people. I know them, but I've no desire to be one only because it's not my nature. If it's not your nature, then you, you're not, you know, holier than thou or gooder than thou. It's just not your nature, full stop. And what about your legacy? Will it be the charity stuff we talk about more than Jim will fix it? Because that's the thing we immediately associate with you. I ain't going. It's too good here. Uh, I, I am probably the only person that you ever will speak to that had a death certificate written out when I was two years old. But when I was two years old, something was wrong with me. And so in those days, I went with the doctor, but doctors didn't have cars. They had to walk with the bag in their hand. And the doctor came around, took one look at me and said, right, that's it, and wrote out a death certificate, left it on the sideboard in the bedroom. But I didn't die. So the next morning, the Duchess got two pence, uh, which was a phone call in those days. I took me a phone call down and phoned the doctor and said, he's still alive. Oh, says the doctor, uh, I'll come round. So he walked round uh, on his rounds and, and he said, so he is. And he got the death certificate and tore it up. And that was it. So there's not many people who speak to us had a death certificate <laughs> torn up by the very doctor that wrote the damn thing out. <laughs> Let me just end by throwing some names at you of the people you've met, because you've met some incredible people, worked with them. Elvis, what was he like? Elvis was fantastic. What a wonderful, wonderful fella. He really was. He was a bit like myself insofar as uh, he all he wanted was a good time. That's why he never went anywhere. He wanted the sunshine, he wanted his pals, he wanted to do his karate, and he wanted to do this, that, and the other. And he'd make a record, and he'd make a, a million dollars out of a record. So he didn't feel he had to go. He was a marvellous guy. I was in a... Uh, I was with him in, in L.A., and we were in a car showroom, and he said, come and look at my new car. And so we went, there's this marvellous drop-head Cadillac. And I'm saying, oh, that's terrific. And this, that, and the other was in the, in the window. And there was some, there was a man and a woman looking through the window, uh, and they see Elvis. They didn't know who I was from a dog's dinner, but they see Elvis. And went, ah, oh, Elvis, oh, Elvis. and he looked at it, and he was shy, and that was what made him devastating because he was shy. Mm. And and he and he went, and he beckoned them in, and he said, "Hello." And they said, oh, Elvis said, and the other, he said, "Do you like my new car?" And they said, "Yeah." And he said to the fella, "He says, have you got another one?" <laughs> and he says. Not the same colour, sir. And he said, well, that's it. And he said, that's yours. And they, they, they gave him the exact car by a different colour. And, and, and we're, we're somebody that's got a style like that. I mean, he was a tremendous good. Who else do you want to know about? Sinatra. Did you meet him? Frank. Yes, Frank. Uh, it was a completely different world because that was the world, with respect, of um, villainry. Now, Frank wasn't a villain, but because he was an enormous star, uh, the villains, easy to understand, call them the mafia. The mafia, they treated stars like pets, like pet dogs or pet cats, right? And they always had to have a star, right? And Frank was one of the biggest, so he knew all the top people. And uh, so I was going from Elvis in LA to Las Vegas. And so I was Frank Sinatra's guest at the Sands Hotel. It got pulled down not long since and when I got there Frank was coming but unfortunately he was with JFK in Washington 
and the snow came and this plane couldn't take off. So it didn't actually get there some another time, but it didn't get that that time. But because I was there, he put his, his pals, <laughs> unbelievable villains, uh, they were all old geezers, fat geezers, and they sat in chairs, and they all <laughs> sort of this, that, and the other. And, and what happened was, uh, out into the desert, there was a, a, a club called El Casa Vegas, right? And he was the referee in between the two teams, which was the Sands team and the DI team, the Desert Inn team. And he was the man that brought peace with them uh, until the two teams put together. And then they said to him, right, who do you want to be with? He said, I don't want to be with anybody. They said, well, you can't be on your own. It's it's untidy, you know. We're, we're all together now. One or the other is no. So they burnt this place down whilst I was there. <laughs> burnt it to the ground. There was people running about the desert with his pajamas on and things like that. And 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 I saw the confrontation when he come in <laughs> to the sands. He come into the sands and he put his arms out like this and he says, "Why, why?" And they said, "Jaime, what's wrong? What's wrong?" He says, "You burnt the place down." He says, "Jaime, Jaime, just a minute." Are you married to my cousin's sister? <laughs> you know it. Well, that makes you family. No, yes, it does. Now, sit down. And they calmed him down, and, and that was it. <laughs> and he didn't have to join either one or the other because he didn't have a place left. It had been burnt to the ground. Incredible. And of all the people you met, who was the most interesting? Did anybody make you starstruck? No, not starstruck. I have an enormous respect for people. And it doesn't matter whether it's a hospital porter who uh, one, one of my pals I worked with for years and years and years and years called Joe. He had my enormous respect because it was worth it. So I have respect for people, but not necessarily starstruck as such. Although I enjoy, I enjoy seeing them. But uh, respect is far more important than being starstruck. Do you have to also keep the balance with your job that you're not walked over and made a fool of and that you don't suffer fools gladly? I don't mind being walked over. People have tried to walk over me all their life. Finish up with a broken leg, that's all right. <laughs> Talking of your wrestling days, I noticed a poster on the wall down there. You love that. Did I read 35 matches, 35 losses? <laughs> yeah, the first 35 fights. Because because nobody, no wrestler wanted to go home and say, being beaten by a long-haired disc jockey. <laughs> And I got murdered. In fact, in Leicester it was. Uh, we finished up with 11 coppers in the ring. All oh, those murders. People jumped in the ring and then they sent for the police and the police come in. And then I got a, a big pain at the top of my thigh and I turned around and it was a woman with an umbrella with a steel s spike on the bottom. And I said, ooh, what did you do? And she said, no, no, you love him, him, him. <laughs> What an amazing life and an amazing career. And we've not even touched the sides. It's been a true honour meeting you. And thank you very much for allowing me into your home and getting an insight into the Jimmy Savile world because it's extraordinary. And thank you for the memories. You brought so much happiness to so many people, and especially of my generation. I see a couple of letters on the wall there from Jim Will Fix It. You touched people in so many ways and you almost didn't have to try, did you? Well, I didn't consciously try. It's just that I did what I did. If it was palatable to people, then I was a winner. And if it wasn't palatable, I wouldn't have been in business. And it appears to have been palatable. And I'm still the same today as ever I was. Uh, odd. Very odd. So, Jimmy Savile, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure.